Everybody, welcome to our University of Universities Port Talk. This morning, I gave a talk in uh, the School of Arts at Reykjavik, and I told them they I was asked to explain this project, University of Universities, and I told them that the best quality of our project is, without any doubt, the human team. I believe that what we are doing cannot be done in any other way that we do. I mean, to, we are doing everything free and I don't know how much, if there is enough money to pay this uh, collaboration between both students and teachers. So uh, we have been, as you know, we have been growing from six universities. Now we are 25 and the pattern of growth always has been the same. We ask our students Erasmus, who was the most interesting teacher in their own schools, or we, of course, continue working with those uh, colleagues, Erasmus colleagues that we knew from the past that they were working so well. So one day, Mike Devereaux told us, there is somebody, a teacher in Bordeaux that should be here. And well, with that, it was enough for us. <laughs> Until some weeks ago, talking Maria Luna and I with uh, Osin Laulonier, he showed us his collaboration with a group called the translation in English would be something like the noise of the fridge. And we were fascinated. And definitely we asked him that he had to be here explaining that collaboration. So please allow me to have a toast for Osin and for all his notes. Thank you. Enjoy your drinks. <laughs> thanks for, for, for introducing me and th thanks Mike for saying nice things about me. <laughs> it doesn't have pretenses of being a scientific talk, but at the same time, it's a reflexive approach to a pheno phenomenon that I have been able to observe firsthand because uh, I am a founding member of this collective called Rue du Frigo. We started this collective, even if I, I have an on off participation with them today, I work in the same offices, uh, but I have my own activities as a teacher, searcher, and uh, for 15 years, even, years, even as an architect and urban designer. So we have this phenomenon in Bordeaux, which I'm going to talk about, which is something very unique and which is beginning to spread in France and even abroad. And we call them les refuges périurbains, which would translate as the suburban uh, cabins or um, shelters. Uh, and um, what I'm trying to point out today is that you, we may consider these uh, shelters as activators of a territory-wide network of public spaces in suburbia. And so, I'd like to start this way is in French, if you type these two words combined on your favorite uh, search engine on the Internet, if you Google it, as the Americans say, if you put periurbain, which is suburbia or suburban or peri-urban, and you combine it with Bordeaux, if you combine it with any other French city in France, you will have pictures of uh, little houses, of highways, of uh, roads, of uh, shopping centers. But if you combine suburbia with Bordeaux in French, you end up with these pictures that pop up on your screen, which is when unexpected the first time it happens to you. Even myself, I was quite surprised. So what are these artifacts? What are these apparently micro architectures that seem to each have a very specific surrounding and a very specific uh, architectural uh, uh, form? Um, if you are attracted by one of these images, if you start clicking, then you very often will end up on this other screen on another site, which is an institutional site of uh, uh, the local uh, land use and, and planning authority, where you will come across uh, documents like this one, which is uh, made on um, Open Street. And you see this the, the, the city of Bordeaux, the metropolis of Bordeaux, and you see these little points, these little um, ideograms that appear around the, 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 the city. And if you click on them, then they have names. 
and you you even see that you can make reservations and it's something a bit intriguing. If you superimpose this with a map of the Bordeaux metropolis, then you see that what I've just shown you is included in, in this area, which is around the ring which surrounds uh, uh, the Bordeaux uh, metropolis, the, the, the city, historical city of Bordeaux and the first ring of uh, uh, municipalities. This is the whole um, network of municipalities that constitute the Bordeaux, the big Bordeaux metropolis. And if you superimpose on this, uh, these little ideograms that you, we just saw, and if you have kept the memory of some of the pictures, then you realize that you have these pictures seem to be um, dispatched on this first ring around, uh, this first suburban ring in uh, the metropolis uh, of Bordeaux. So what are we looking at? The other thing that pops up is the name of Bruit du Frigo. And to just say, it's not easy for me to speak of Bruit du Frigo in a few words, but I will. Uh, Bruit du Frigo is a collective that was created in 1997 by a group of architects, uh, architects, a group of students in architecture that were in their fourth or fifth year. I was the only one who had recently graduated and who was looking for a job and was fed up being exploited by local firms and looking for some ideals. And one of the first ideas or ideals that we had was how can we use what we have learned, the skills and the education, and make a, a kind of ethical use of, of these tools we had, and maybe use them as a means of uh, involving people in transforming their environment, and hence empowering them. That was the uh, naive, at the time anyway, idea that evolved and gave Bruit du Frigo, which was created in 1997, so Bruit du Frigo mainly is uh, not so much a studio because it's a non-profit. So it's an art and architecture collective that was founded in 97. Uh, it has a, a, a core of five, six persons who work there full time. And then another layer of people and amongst the other 15 people that gravitate around Bruit du Frigo, come in, go out, come in, go out. But I've been on board for since the creation till today, probably one of the dinosaurs of the, the Bruit du Frigo. And um, so all these interventions, this, this, uh, this idea of uh, using your skills as an architect, as an urban designer, as a, a landscape architect, or as a, a planner to um, imagine processes, bottom-up processes that would involve local communities in transforming uh, their living environment and working on empowering the communities through uh, the, this approach. Uh, takes the, 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 the various forms, mainly artistic, they are always contextual, they are always participatives, and they always mix spatial urban installations, microarchitectures, and even they tend to rely on local citizens' initiatives. We never come in somewhere and just, just throw something down thinking, that, okay, we thought of something interesting and this is good for you. So this is just a, a few of the, the projects over the years. That I'm not going to talk about. This is me, younger. <laughs> and uh, so there is always a kind of, um, I always tend to call it a, a spatial and temporal capsule that is created and that kind of gathers life for a very short period of time and where there is always a cultural and artistic program which, which enables us to work on very serious issues in relation to uh, planning or uh, regeneration or um, even architectural projects. Uh, and the work is always done in an interdisciplinary approach with architects, uh, artists, um, uh, researchers, and of course, uh, local inhabitants. So to come back to these uh, suburban shelters, where did this story and this emergence that you see in the pictures, where did this all come from? So nearly 20 years ago, uh, the current director of Brut du Frigo, whose name is Yvan Detraz, was working on his uh, thesis, uh, his final project in architecture. And he engaged in this um, experience of walking around all the suburbs of, of Bordeaux for three months. Uh, at the time, we did have internet, but we didn't have smartphones. We didn't have all these um, uh, available uh, uh, GPS, so everything was done on maps and walking. 
and um, he, he he walked around this uh, the, 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 this um, around Bordeaux and asked himself two questions. Uh, he was wondering if the urban outskirts of the Bordeaux metropolis were produced new forms of public space that were not the forms that we know in the city center and which are mainly inherited from the 19th century or from the medieval times and did what was called or interpreted as wastelands did they have the potential to invent new forms of public space for suburbia and maybe uh, for people instead of people moving from suburbia to the city center to enjoy public spaces that they would move from one suburbia to another one to enjoy public spaces of a different quality and a different scale. So what he did at the time is he walked around Bordeaux like a madman for three months. And he, this is all the paths that he walked around the metropolis on foot every single day. And all these were put on, were mapped. And then this led to the, the identification of what was called wastelands of the urban area of Bordeaux in 1999. And all these spaces are uh, are mainly spaces that have been had been kind of shut down and cut away by the creation of the the, the ring around Bordeaux that had split spaces between each side uh, of the ring. So you could have former chateaus, you could have uh, uh, farmland, uh, industrial sites, um, uh, natural sites, and they were up till then kind of invisible spaces or considered as uh, uh, rundown areas that did not attract uh, any special attention. And during that experiment uh, and this analysis, uh, the idea that uh, was introduced was to identify and to classify the different types of spaces that were not regarded 20 years ago as potential public spaces. Huh? It could be an artificial lake, it could be a stadium, it could be uh, German bunkers, it was all, uh, a whole variety of typologies of spaces and artifacts of different scales and this produced lots of very interesting uh, maps where you have all the network of spaces classified by typology with all the network of connections and the idea at the time was to say uh, that if we wanted to give if we wanted the inhabitants of the Bordeaux metropolis to give any type of value and then to actually practice these spaces we had to reveal these spaces their spatial qualities and then find means of bringing people in a very non-costly way to use these spaces uh, and that the use of these spaces by everybody would not mean um, massive uh, public funding and investments that was the idea behind it was to say it has to be cheap it has to take a very little um, uh, investment and transformation of the site and it has to preserve these sites and make them visible and then maybe that was the hypothesis people would value them and would protect them and maybe that would go back up into the system and onto, onto the higher levels of and the and the authorities so after this mapping was done we in Bru du Frigo started doing you see it's 1999 huh? uh, we started doing what we used to call suburban picnics and we used to gather in all these places that had been spotted and we used to have we used to be using fax machines and things like that and we used to invite all the people we knew to come over and we used to have a series of picnics like that that over you know, every month or every month and a half you'd have a picnic and this was a picnic organized in a network of abandoned tennis courts that we found so we decided to to organize picnics in those areas and start to experiment them and we started having this growing feeling that these we needed to stay longer in these spaces so used to used to be a mix of having food and eating together and taking time and discovering the place and also uh, very often there would be some kind of uh, artistic activity going on at the same time and this gradually led because we were moving from space to pace to space uh, led to uh, creating uh, sessions of uh, suburban hikes where we would explore uh, the, the the outskirts of the city and sometimes even the the, the 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 very close ones in different situations and start informing all these maps in even more in even more detail and this gave rise to a project 20 years ago was which was very simple and the idea stemmed from this uh, thesis which was um, 
would it be possible stemming from the work we were doing to create a network of suburban hiking trails and that we were convinced of because we were practicing it already and then we realized when we used to stay there and picnic there and stay there very late in the evening that and we tried once to stay overnight and we realized that settling down like settlers in these spaces and waking up in these spaces was a whole total different experience of space and um, appropriation of these spaces and the idea that gave rise to an idea of in France we have and probably elsewhere we have certainly elsewhere when you go to the mountains if you get lost you always find a shelter somewhere where you can go in and you'll find to sleep and probably some wood to at least survive and the idea was to say why would we not do the same thing not to survive but the idea would be to live for at least 24 hours in these exceptional areas that we had found exceptional either for their beauty or for what they were revealing in a different form of beauty uh, and the idea of creating a network of hiking trails that would be punctuated by suburban shelters which each would be in a unique uh, environment and would have a unique architecture related to what it wants to reveal and say of that environment could offer this new experience of the suburb and so this was the hidden agenda that was not said at the time to the authorities because they would have just said no and the idea was say if we managed to do this which was a utopia then maybe we are creating a new public equipment for new urban uses in the future but this was really theory so this we created this um, uh, suburban hiking program that has become not only Brou du Frigo, it's become an institution in Bordeaux. Local authorities organize hikes all the time. Uh, it's become something absolutely ordinary, which is very happy with because that means it's working. So um, from the year 2000 till today, this has been an ongoing experiment that has revealed lots of things. And uh, we even had uh, crossroads with uh, uh, Stalker, the Italian group. Uh, which are also in an approach where they, they they experiment, they test things, and they have their social involvement, and they practice their architecture through uh, hiking and meeting communities uh, on the outskirts of Roma and other cities. So this was the first layer of the experiment, which was to institutionalize uh, the activity of suburban walking. And this is the, the, the first map of suburban paths that had, uh, Yvon had revealed in his thesis at the time, which was now today it's on computerized supports and it's much more uh, completed and uh, we have tested that it takes six days to go around the metropolis uh, it has been done before and it's it enables us to discover the great variety of uh, landscapes the natural and the architectural lands um, uh, heritage and that finally most cities offer all sorts of opportunities of going elsewhere without having to take a plane uh, or travel hundreds of miles and that there is a kind of exotism that is just on your doorstep if you take the time to look at things differently so uh, i won't go into fi figures but just one or two there's has been more than 30 um urban hikes since uh, 1999 1200 kilometers of uh, initial um finding the 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 the, um, the the hiking paths and uh each of these um uh hikes uh gathers at least 90 persons uh i mean when we're down 50 that's low huh? and we go off for two days uh, in the average so these are just a few photographs where you can see this is something i practice every day in my car it just looks like a, a, an infrastructure but when you practice it as a, a person walking, then it becomes something that, of a, a, a Titan-esque scale and a totally, completely uh, different experience. So it's suburban safaris, uh, if, you, if, you, if you wish. And then we always have someone, uh, an artist or a historian or whatever, uh, with us to also sometimes uh, have a kind of, uh, uh, as you say, decade, I don't know how you say that in English, but uh, the things they'd be saying while we're traveling would be, completely uh, not in opposition but would would kind of, kind of be odd comparing to what we're looking at and sometimes that's used to open people's gaze so these are a few pictures that i'm going to go through that is when you stay on the spot then you sleep on 
it shows you the var variety of landscapes that you can go through. So this is just a little bracket I'm opening at this spot uh, at this time. Sorry, it is that at some point this process of uh, uh, okay trying to institutionalize uh, the hiking walks. At some point, there's going to be a meeting between this process, which finally is a process from a non-profit and a kind of bottom-up initiative at, for one kind of, uh, I don't know, uh, we also all very often talk about serendipity. There was one point where suddenly we crossed the road um, of a local politician and Suddenly, there's an intersection between the, what the collective is imagining and the spatial planning project of the metropolis. And when did that happen? These are the three institutions that got involved at some point, which is the Bordeaux Metropolis. And also, um, uh, this is uh, an institution that does mainly big scale, scale planning. And they what they did is seen this use of um, this suburban hiking. They had this big, uh, we call it the Le, Le When I was a student uh, 20 years ago, uh, this is an element of the topography of Bordeaux. Bordeaux is a flat city, but when you look at the, 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 the east bank of the city, actually, when you look at the horizon, we have a green horizon, which is uh, uh, a hill, which is very green. And I, when I was a student, we just used to not see it. It was there, but it was just there. And it was just considered as this very green strip with uh, old chateaus inside, uh, quite run down. And it was considered as a kind of border between municipalities and nothing else. And then the local authorities at the metropolitan level at some point started saying, hey, there's something here that is a kind of linear park. What could we do? And what could bring it, reintegrate it into the local community's imagination and perceptions of space. And they saw the work of Rue du Frigo and the urban hikes, and they thought, mm, there's maybe something to do. And what Ur Rue du Frigo did at the time, instead of taking local communities on a urban hike to convince them of the view of the politicians, they said, okay, we accept the mission, but it's you we will take on an urban hike for two days. So you had all the politicians of Bordeaux, with backpacks and uh, not the right shoes and not the right trousers and anything. And for two days, they walked through all this with the local mayors of the municipalities. And that came up with, it, it went up all the scales of uh, local planification because suddenly it existed. They had practiced the space. They could talk about it. They could relate to the space. And it was integrated into the development uh, of the, at the urban scale of the metropolis, as today it's called Le Parc des Coteaux. It's the, the park of the green hills. And it is an element that federates and organizes the planning and the urbanism on this side of the city, whilst before it was invisible, it was an empty space. So that's just um, something I wanted to say, because for me, it's interesting to see that you have a, a bottom up process that really meets, meets the top down process and becomes an, uh, creates an act of actually shaping the, the 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 city and then what happened from there is they to make it exist they said okay we're convinced we want to have projects but how can we make this exist so a biennale was created which still exists today it's the biennale of the this green hill and it's an artistic and it's contemporary art biennale which is very much anchored in geography and the artist work insight and the first edition was given to Bru du Frigo to act as a um, curator and what they did is they, they, they used it to make a proposal. They said, mm, there is a very interesting space, which is an abandoned factory. And uh, we have this little cabin that we, we could put there and we could, uh, people could uh, rent it for free for one month, every night, someone else could use it. And it was supposed to stay there 30 days. On the 25th day, Bruyne Frigo started phoning the local authorities, please, can we have a few weeks more? I think Javier would do that type of thing. And um, <laughs> rings a bell. And uh, and they, they, they said no, and then um, you wouldn't take no as an answer and to phone other people. Okay, you have another month. At the end of the day, it stayed one year on the spot. And what happened is... It was visited by lo lots of politicians and one politician that had also a training in planning saw this installation and made the connection with the scale of the metropolis and start started 
engaging in discussions, uh, revealing all these a network of natural spaces around Bordeaux of very high land, uh, ecological and also uh, aesthetical quality and value. But for protection reasons, you're not allowed to build anything. And actually, local authorities, their best way of protecting these spaces was to shut them down. No public access. And the discussion that started to get engaged with Brugge Frigo was to say, if you want people to protect these spaces, they need to know that they exist and they need to love them. And to love them, they need to get to know them. And if they, you want them to know these spaces, they must practice them. And if you want them to practice, you know where I'm going, you need to hike. And if you want to have a fuller experience, you need to be able to stay on a bit, maybe one night. So you see the cabin we did, blah, blah, blah. Maybe we can imagine something where you could have a network of cabins in all these spaces, and then you could connect them to local uh, loops of farmers, uh, um, trails and uh, all sorts of layers of connecting locally to different scales of the territory. And this group of politicians absolutely immediately got the point because they were trying to position this local authority, which is, was only known to the populations as the people who take taxes, uh, they treat, you know, uh, waste, uh, repair, um, I don't know, electrical installations, but they wanted to give this image. We are working on the living environment. So they were very interested and we knew they were. So this became, okay, we give you this, you give us something else in return. So what finally was negotiated, I'm, I'm giving it very easy. It took lots of time and, uh, sometimes it was nerve wracking, but the idea was, okay, so. The idea was to create all these loops, hiking loops around the metropolis. As you say here, there's 15 daily hiking loops possible, and there's uh, 300 kilometers of loops that you can do around Bordeaux. And that, that these loops would be punctuated by these suburban shelters, which would all be very specific to each area and would have a narrative related to where they were uh, implemented. And um, uh, that's when Brou du Frigo moved into the, the second step, as I said earlier on, with the, this first shelter, which was called Le Nuage, the cloud, and uh, went into a negotiation with uh, the guy who used to be the prime minister at the time, uh, Alain Juppé, and um, into developing this concept at the scale of the metropolis. So this was the first one that was built to stay 30 days and stayed on. The idea at the beginning was these shelters were not meant to last and stay outside. So they would be pulled back um, in winter, refurbished and put out again uh, when the good weather uh, arrived. So this is a former uh, site where they used to make cement and that has become a, a big urban park now. And this is one of the things that kind of brought the gaze of the authorities to the qualities of this space. And then the refurb, the regeneration project came after. So this is where it is. It's really minutes away from, from the city center. Then these are other ones that followed every year. There was a new one. So in the 15 cities, I showed you around the, the, around the center of Bordeaux. And what is interesting to say is that the two first ones were, were, were done by Bru du Frigo. And then, so other ones were this, another ones were curated. So this was made by artists with a very anthropomorphical approach. This is very popular. If you freely rent one night, you can't sleep because people are lock, knocking on the windows and saying, oh, can I come in? I want to see and so on. Um, it's called the watchbirds. This is another one, which is called the, the, the witch's star. This is another one that was built in a, a park. This park was created on 15 meters of a former wasteland, you know, garbage, um, a garbage site. And I say that in English, uh, in Deschetri. It's called the empty tea, uh, tea, uh, tree trunk. 
This one was made by an artist. You see, when it's made by Brut du Frigo, it is more architectural and slightly maybe design and arty. When it's made by artists, there is a whole mythological narrative here. It's supposed to be a snake that comes out of this 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 lake. It's a a, a mythogenesis that doesn't exist. This is called the uh, La Nuit Américaine, which is the, the technique that the, uh, you use in cinema to create a night atmosphere in plain daylight. And it looks down on uh, a big industrial area in Bordeaux. You think you were in Manhattan or something. You know, the places are chosen also because they take you elsewhere. So here it is, which is special treatment, filter treatment on the windows to give you a cinemascope effect. You see? This one was, is a bit weird. It looks like a kind of cosmic uh, interplanetary connection system. <laughs> it's created by an artist, huh? I think needless to say. This was created by um, uh, Studio Weave from London. Uh, something I can say, which is very important, I said it earlier on, all these uh, areas are uh, wildlife preserved and natural preserved areas where you're not allowed to build. So officially, these are not architectures. They are officially, it's written in contracts, considered as works, performative works of art, which take meaning or sense when they are performed by people. That is the official definition. And there is no foundations for this building. It actually has a, a slab of 40 centimeters, which is and foundation, but uh, well, everything was made to go uh, around uh, local restrictions. This is an artist also. <laughs> this is built on a 1970s uh, artificial lake. Well, uh, so I'm getting to the end. It's just to say then, as I was explaining earlier on, you have this initiative that starts with using walking as a means of exploring, feeling space, but also building a gaze and informing the conditions of the evolution of space at a local and at a metropolitan level. It brought this network of uh, hiking uh, walks, uh, this network of shelters, and then because it was hand in hand with the local authorities, sites were created to show all I showed earlier on of these different layers of interconnection. And very important also, and th this is something that was, we nearly took the authorities to court. They wanted to, at one point they said, this is a very good idea. Actually, we'll keep the idea and we will uh, call in on artists and famous architects to build these micro architectures. And we will call them the metropolitan shelters. And uh, at the time, Rudy Frigo said, yes, okay, we will see you in court uh, for stealing intellectual property and because they wanted to make them you know we have more of a conservative and uh, what a uh, political um, municipality for nearly 40 or 50 years here and they saw them as a way of showing a beautiful image of bordeaux and using them as places that you would rent off for very expensive uh, amounts of money uh, for a big amount of money and the idea behind this was no this is community based so this has to be free and accessible to everybody which when when we go to other countries people just say how can you offer this to people well this is the whole point and so what was negotiated was it remains free property has been handed over to the local authorities they now these micro architectures remain on site they are uh they have been rebuilt to be permanently outdoor and then there is a season when you can start the reservations you can try from abroad also i mean you can re reservation 24 hours for free but uh there's hundreds of people there that try to connect at the same time so there is now an official reservation center that you can do online and you can choose whatever uh, place you want to go to you access a whole load of um documents either on your smartphone or even you can collect them locally, you know, on paper, where you find all the, 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 the secondary um, hike uh, loops, what you can visit, or where you can buy things. Um, you can see uh, this is one of the networks, 
uh, on uh, the one of the, the the sides of the of the river, and today this is the booking website as I was just showing a few minutes ago, and uh, it's managed by Bru du Frigo and another non-profit called Zebra Trois. Uh, Bordeaux Metropole, the Bordeaux Metropolis, is there for the um, operating, financing, and maintenance and the communication. Uh, the running of the whole uh, network uh, till this day has cost um, 1,500,000 and this concept is today being uh, studied for um, cities like Nantes and also around Paris. Uh, and there is a uh, Frigo is member of an international network of metropolitan hiking trails, as you can see the names of the cities here. And that's it. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. Voila. Merci. Thank you, Otin. So the, the, the idea is I <laughs> go away while you have your drink. <laughs> the rules are no, no questions and we continue drinking to your good, good health. Yeah. Okay, well, I hope you enjoyed it. We'll talk about this in the future because you won't have me twice. <laughs> okay. okay, so have a nice drink and uh, say nice things. Okay, bye. Bye. Bye.